It's a huge honor to be sharing uh, the word tonight. I'm actually going to be continuing our series on victory. Pastor Dave started the series this morning, and it's based in uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, where it says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And some of the things that Pastor Dave mentioned this morning is that um, right believing is what unlocks victory in our lives. And that victory in every area of our lives starts in our soul. And so I'd love to continue uh, that tonight. And our dream for this series is that you would live in victory from victory. You would live in victory from victory. That is the heart of this series. So we're going to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, if you got your Bible tonight. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 says this, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat of the fruit from the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, You must not eat of it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat of it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called the man and said, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. We'll quickly jump back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. It says this, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And they felt no shame. The title of my message tonight is called Victory Over Shame. Victory Over Shame. Why don't we bow our heads and pray together as we get into the message. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing in this room tonight. I thank you that not one person has come into this place by accident, but that you have an appointed encounter ready for each one of us. God, tonight as we talk about shame, I know that my words and my opinions and the opinions of the world uh, are not much and they can't change much. But God, I know that when your word is spoken in this room, it can touch every heart, touch every life, change every spirit. God, it can truly set us free tonight. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak in this place. I ask that you would come and move like only you can move. Do what only you can do. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Why don't you go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, you are the best looking person at the 6 p.m. service at LifePoint Church tonight. You are without a doubt. The best looking person. Some of you are like, amen, preach. She's right. This girl's preaching. Victory over shame. Victory over shame. In this passage of scripture, we're going right back to the beginning. Right back to where it all began. Right back to the beginning of the foundation of the world. And we see that God is creating Uh, the heavens and the earth. He's creating human beings. He creates Adam and Eve. And the Bible stops to tell us in the book of Genesis very early on in in chapter 2, it stops to tell us one very important thing about Adam and Eve. And it stops and it says, Adam and Eve were naked and they felt 
no shame. They were naked and they felt no shame. It's a very strange thing that the Bible mentions. It doesn't seem like it's that important or it simply doesn't seem like it should be the most important thing that should be shared about these people who have just been formed. You see, God doesn't uh, unravel the history of their biology. He doesn't tell us super important things like, and there are animals in the garden and they can talk. Like he doesn't tell us all of the important things like uh, Adam and Eve, they don't have a belly button. Like we want to know these things. He doesn't tell us any of the things that we want to know. He doesn't even say, hey, uh, they're in the garden and I love them so much. He doesn't say they're in the garden and, you know, they've got lots of peace and lots of joy and they're just perfect. No, the one thing that God wants to communicate to us in Genesis chapter 2 is that Adam and Eve were naked and they felt no shame. God felt that the most important thing for us to know about human beings is that shame is not a part of his plan. That shame was never meant to permeate our lives. I was never meant to carry shame. And so in the book of Genesis chapter 2, God says, hey, you need to know, firstly, they're naked and they feel no shame. Why did God say that they were naked? Moses is writing to the group of Israelites, the most shameful thing, the most basic shameful thing that they can carry is their nakedness. If you were to see the the nakedness of another person in Israel, it is an intensely shameful thing to witness. And so God is saying, hey, they are naked and they feel no shame. Shame was not a part of the plan. Shame is a part of the fall. Shame is a part of the curse. And so we see that God then comes looking for Adam and Eve after they make this mistake, they talk to the snake and they sin. God comes looking for Adam and Eve and he says, where are you? He goes looking for his image bearers, the ones who are created to reflect his glory here on earth, the ones who are called to carry his image and his glory to the world around them. He goes looking for his image bearers and he can't find them. And he says, Adam and Eve, where are you? What's hiding you? What's stopping you from being all that I've called you to be? What's keeping you from sharing my glory on earth? What's keeping you from bearing my image in the garden today? And he goes to them and the answer we see is shame. The thing that was hiding them and causing them to hide the image of God, the thing that was causing them to step back from the calling that God had put on their lives was shame. And you know what? Tonight I believe that God is prophetically calling a a generation and he is saying, where are you? Where are you? What's holding you back from being all that I've called you to be? What's holding you back from being the ones who are called to carry and bear the image of Christ here on the earth? What's holding you back from reaching your full potential in God tonight? And you know what I believe? After studying the Word of God and studying this topic of shame, I believe that so often the answer comes back to shame. It is shame that is hiding us. It is shame that is stopping us. It is shame that is limiting us. So often it comes back to shame one way or another. You know, nobody um, likes to give things away for free anymore. Like we live in a society that's almost conditioned to think that if somebody is giving away something for free, then it's got to have a loophole, right? We're like, what is the loophole? What is your loophole uh, on, on this claim that you're allowing, allowing me to make. And so we see that, you know, maybe uh, some, some of the youth, you might go to Boost Juice when they have a free juice, you know, and it's like free juices for all the Sarahs and the Jacksons. And you're like, yes, my name is Sarah. I can go and get a free Boost Juice today. And so you go into Tea Tree Plaza and you line up in the massive queue behind 30 people to get your Boost Juice and you finally get to the front. And, and you look at Susan on the cash register and you're like, hey, Susan, how are you going today? And she's like, I'm good. And you're like, oh, I actually am entitled to a free boost juice. 
And she's like, oh, okay, is your name Sarah or Jackson? And you're like, yeah, my name's Sarah. And, and she's like, no worries, can I just see your license or some form of identification, please? And you pull out your ID and your name is Sarah, but it's spelled S-A-R-A. And Susan on the cash register says, hey, I'm sorry, we're only giving out free boost juices to people whose name is Sarah with an H. So you're either going to have to pay for this boost juice or you're going to have to run along home. There's a loophole. There's a catch. There's a loophole that disqualifies Sarah from getting her boost juice. And you know what? So often I think we can be conditioned to think about the loopholes when it comes to claiming things in our world. We can go, hey, what's the loophole? I'm not going to make a claim because of the loophole, because I probably won't be the type of person that they're looking for, or I might not be the, the name that they're looking for. I might not have everything that they're searching for, and so therefore I can't make the claim. And you know what? I believe in the same way that shame is the self-imposed, hell-endorsed loophole over every claim that God wants us to make in the Christian life. Shame is the self-imposed, hell-endorsed loophole over every claim that God has called us to make in the Christian life. Shame can hold us back from making a claim on the cross, from making a claim on the things that God has purchased for us. So I want to know tonight, what's your loophole? What's your loophole? What's the shame loophole that's stopping you from living in the fullness of everything that God has called you to? What's the shame loophole that is stopping you from making a claim tonight? Is your shame loophole, I don't come from the right family. I'm not pure enough. I'm not smart enough. I've messed up too much. I'm not educated enough. I'm not perfect enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough speaker. I'm not a good enough singer. I'm not a good enough leader. I'm not a good enough worker. I'm not a good enough friend. I'm not a good enough ma ma mother. I'm not a good enough mother. I'm not a good enough father. I'm not a good enough wife. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not even good enough to get married. That's not me declaring that over my life. I don't believe that. That's not my shame loophole tonight. Amen. <laughs> I have lots of shame loopholes, but I don't know if they'll come out tonight, maybe. Um, but we all have these shame loopholes in our lives. They might be attached to something that we've done, something that we failed to do in our past. Maybe it's attached to something that's been done to us. Maybe it's attached to our background. Or maybe our shame loophole is even attached to something that we don't feel capable of doing in our future. So we live in this constant state of shame that says, I'll never be good enough. I'll never be able to do that. I'll never be the leader. I'll never be the speaker. I'll never be the mother. I'll never be the father. I'll never have the power to do what God has called me to do. What is your shame loophole tonight? It's important to know that guilt and shame are not the same. Guilt and shame are not the same. Someone named uh, Kurt Thompson, he was the author of The Soul of Shame. And he says that most people say it's when we feel embarrassed or humiliated or uncomfortable um, that we think that this, this is a shameful experience. We think of humiliating public events, but the reality is that most shame takes place inside your head dozens of times every day. It's silent, it's subtle, it's characterized by the quiet, self-condemning conversation that we've learned since we were kids. There's a difference between guilt and shame. See, guilt, guilt can sometimes be good. Guilt can sometimes lead us to change our behaviors. It can make us make a change in our behaviors. See, guilt tells us that we've done something wrong. It identifies that we've done something wrong. But shame tells us that we are something wrong. Shame tells me that there is something wrong with me. There is something fundamentally flawed about who I am. Just to demonstrate this, if I went to, down to KFC after the service tonight and I got myself a massive bucket of chicken with, I don't know how many, 30 pieces of chicken in that bucket and I sat there at KFC and I ate every single piece of chicken, 
I could sit there. Some of the men can apparently do it. Um, But I could not do that. If I sat there and I ate all of those pieces of chicken, I would look at the bottom of the bucket at all of those bones. And my guilt would say something like this. Oh, my gosh, what just happened? I probably shouldn't have done that. I better go to the gym tomorrow and work out extra hard and maybe even set some healthy, healthy boundaries in place for my eating habits. Ari calls it tuna for lunchtime. When you're putting on a little bit of extra weight, it's tuna for lunchtime. So I better, I better put in those healthy habits into place. And, but shame would stop and look at the bucket of chicken and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've done that. I'm disgusting. I have no self-control. I have no way of changing my behavior. Or maybe you fail a maths test and uh, you fail it and guilt would say, hey, I probably should have listened in class. I probably should have studied harder for that test. But shame would say, I failed my maths test. I'm so stupid. I'm probably going to fail at school. I'm never going to be able to get a good job. This is the difference between guilt and shame. Shame is a prison. Shame is a filter that affects the way that we interpret events and the way that we see our lives. Psychologists describe shame as the swampland of the soul. Shame says, I am not enough. I am fundamentally flawed. You know, during the Vietnam War, um, the American uh, army used a chemical called Agent Orange um, to go and destroy crops and, and, and they used it as a form of warfare. And Agent Orange was this chemical that was spread all over the place and um, they spread the chemical and long after you could see the chemical, long after you could see it physically there, after it was invisible and nobody could recognise that it was in the vicinity, it was having effects. It was having long-term effects on anyone who was exposed to it, on anyone who came into contact with this chemical. And so they noticed that people who came into contact with this chemical, uh, it, it started to affect their vision. It started to affect um, their reproductive system. They couldn't produce things. And it even affected the next generation. So as they would be giving birth to kids, uh, they would have kids that would come out with these tumours and heads that are all enlarged or they'd come out with, with um, limbs that hadn't been fully formed. Even long after you could see the chemical and you could see um, it physically, it had lasting effects that lasted on not just one generation but the generation after. And do you know what? I believe that shame acts in the exact same way. Long after the word is spoken over us or long after that moment or that event happens in our lives, long after the thing that causes us shame happens, we see the effects of shame show up in our lives. Maybe it shows up in our ability to see the things of God for our future. Maybe it shows up in our ability to produce the things that God has called us to produce. Or maybe it even shows up in our ability to leave a legacy for the next generation, to have a calling that outlasts us. Shame acts in the same sort of way as Agent Orange. And shame causes us to shrink back, to play it safe, and to settle for less than the life that God has for us. But you know what? The exciting news is that in Christ, we have been given the victory over shame. That Jesus died on a cross, and when he died on a cross, everything that we talked about happening at the garden was turned upside down. Because God said, hey, I need you to know that shame is a result of the fall so that you know when my son dies on a cross and he sheds his blood and he gives his life, that shame is no longer a part of your future. Shame is not a part of our future. In fact, in Isaiah 61, where it prophesies over the coming of the Lord and this Messiah, it says, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion of your land and everlasting joy will be yours. 
In Christ, we have the victory over shame. We can live free from the power of shame. So I want to look tonight very quickly at three places where we can find victory over shame. Where can we find victory over shame? The first place that we can find victory over shame is in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. See, God had spoken to Adam and Eve and he, and he had given them an instruction. He had given them a direction. And all of a sudden, the devil comes in and he tries to tell them something contrary to what God had said. And he said, hey, did God really say that? Did God really tell you this instruction? Did God really tell you that you can't eat from that tree? And so he questions the word of God. And we see that Eve is convinced to act according to what he says and not according to what God says. If we want to have victory over shame, the first place that we can find victory over shame and the first place that Eve and Adam could have found victory over shame before anything ever went wrong is in the Word of God. If she had listened to the Word of God, she wouldn't have inherited shame. He said, did God really say? No, technology is a wonderful thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever done a conference call um, online with, with a number of different people. But on a conference call, they have certain um, ways of doing things so that you don't have everybody speaking over each other at once, right? Um, because if you're talking to someone and someone's overseas and another person's in Queensland, another person's in China, um, it, you want to know, you want to know um, that you're going to be able to have a, a conversation with each other, right? So, um, what happens in these conference calls is that the administrator is actually able to silence and mute any voice that the administrator wants to. So the administrator can control what voices are being heard at any one time in the conversation. Do you know what? In the same way, we are the administrator of shame in our own lives. God has made us the administrator of shame in our lives. And do you know what? It's time to say, hey, devil, you're not going to get the mic. God's got the mic. And so while God's got the mic, you're on mute. Nobody can hear you. I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to your voice. I'm not listening to your truth. I'm not listening to the lies that you try to spin me because God's got the mic. I want to ask you tonight, who's got the mic? Who's holding the mic when it comes to the area of potential shame in your life? Who's holding the mic for your soul? Is, who's holding the mic for that internal dialogue that goes on in your head when you get up on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning? Who's got the mic when it comes to the internal dialogue in your heart? Is it God who's got the mic? Or is it the, the, the enemy? I just need to pick a name for Satan. Lucifer. Is it Lucifer who's got the mic? <laughs> who's got the mic in your life tonight? Who's got the mic? Who's got the mic in my life? I pray that God would always have the mic. I pray that the Word of God would fill my heart, fill my mind, fill my soul, fill every part of me so that God's voice would be overwhelming. I wouldn't be like Eve transferring the mic to, to the enemy and saying, hey, what do you think? What do you think about this situation? So if we want to live a life free from shame, we need to give God the mic. We find a life free from shame when we spend time in the Word of God. The second place where we can find freedom and victory over shame is in the cross of Christ. In the cross of Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says, um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. See, Jesus carried a cross so we would no longer have to carry our shame. Jesus carried his cross so that I would not have to walk through life carrying my shame. 
Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It is what... In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So here is Jesus shaming the devil publicly. And I believe ever since the enemy has been trying to shame Christians privately. He was shamed publicly and so he tries to shame us publicly privately. But it is at the cross that we find victory over the shame that he tries to bring into our lives. Do you know what? When you go to um, a restaurant, um, you might have seen, you know, uh, as you walk past sort of different sections of the restaurant, you might have seen that some areas are sometimes sectioned off. They're, They're the party section and they're booked or they're reserved for a party. And you sort of look at them and maybe you even try and go to sit down in that area. And and the waitress comes over to you and says, excuse me, ma'am, like you're not allowed to sit there. Like that area, that space, those tables, they've already been booked. You can't sit in that area. You can't have your party in that area because a party has already been booked for that space. And you know what? The Bible tells us that the devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. And so I imagine that when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, I imagine that as he was dying on the cross, as he was taking his last breath, I imagine that all of hell was throwing a party. I imagine that they were like, this is awesome. We finally got him and we've got the whole world. They're gone. This is amazing. This is crazy. They're cranking out the mountain dew because surely that's in hell. You know, they're like, this is awesome. This is amazing. And, and all of a sudden, I reckon that their party was interrupted when they heard Jesus knocking on the door. See, because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So I imagine that as all of hell is throwing a party, I imagine that they're throwing a party, they're drinking their mountain dew and all of a sudden a knock comes at the door and Jesus says, Satan, I'm here for my kids. Keys. Satan, I'm here for my keys. It's all over. You've lost the game. See, what the enemy didn't know is that while he was having a party over the cross, while he was having a party thinking that he had won the day, He didn't realize that that cross had already been reserved, that that cross had already been booked, that that cross had already been booked for the salvation, the redemption of the future of humanity. That cross had already been booked for our victory. That cross had already been booked for our celebration and our party. We can find victory in the cross of Christ, victory over shame. The third and final thing, maybe if the worship team could join me, the third and final thing, place where we find victory over shame is in the power of the Holy Spirit. We find victory over shame in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Adam and Eve, when they messed up, when they felt ashamed, it caused them to shrink back and to hide the image of God. It caused them to hide their calling. It caused them to step away from the very thing that God had called them to do. But when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us victory over shame, victory over those things that limit us, victory over those things that are not enough. And he puts his more than enough on us and empowers us to do what we couldn't do in our own selves. In uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, I admit that I haven't acquired the absolute fullness that I am pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past and I fasten my heart to the future instead. 
I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus Christ. Through the anointing of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is working in you. God is for you. The Holy Spirit tells us that God is with us, that He is working in us and that He is for us. The Holy Spirit enables us to live in victory over shame. He enables us to fulfill the calling that God has for our lives. You know what? I, I love frozen yogurt. I don't know if you like frozen yogurt. <laughs> yes, some people down the back. I love frozen yogurt. You can go to Tea Tree Plaza and you can get yourself some frozen yogurt. And, uh, you know, I like the tart flavor. And you, you know, you pull down the thing and you get your frozen yogurt and you put on your lychee jelly and your mango popping pearls and you tip out all your nerds and whatever it is that you put on your frozen yogurt. Um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's definitely happened to me before. And you take your cup of frozen yogurt and you take it to the front um, counter and there's Susan again. She's got two jobs. She works at Boost Juice and Froyo, evidently. And you're like, hey, Susan. She's like, hey. And you put your frozen Coke, fr frozen Coke, frozen yogurt on the scales and, and you put it there and you see that all of a sudden, there's a weight that comes up and it says, this is going to cost you $19. And you're like, excuse me, Susan, why is a little piece of yogurt, some mango popping pearls and some lychee jelly and some nerds going to cost me $19? How can it weigh that much? How can it be of that much value? Do you know what? In the same way, Maybe we can look at ourselves and we can say, hey, I'm not that much. I might not be the, the greatest speaker or the greatest mother or the greatest whatever you are trying to be. You may look at yourselves and you think, hey, I'm not that much. I don't have that much ability. I don't have those many gifts. I'm not rich enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. Whatever it is that you see when you look at yourself. I want to encourage you that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when the anointing of God comes upon you, there is a weight that comes into your life. There is a weight that you carry into every area of your life, an anointing from heaven to bear the image of God here on earth, to take the power of God and bear the glory of God here on earth so a world around us would praise our Father in heaven. You might not feel like much. You might not feel like you look like much. But I want to tell you, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you carry the anointing of God, there is a weight and a value to everything that you carry and everything that you do. We need to be reminded tonight that we can have victory over shame because it's not about me. It's not about my gifts. It's not about my talents. It's not about my ability. I don't have to do anything more to fulfill my calling and achieve my calling than stay in close relationship with Him, than stay under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And if I can stay under His anointing, if I can stay empowered by Him, I know that He will make all the difference, that He will bring all the value, that He will give me all the weight that I need to carry carry and fulfill my calling. You know, Ephesians chapter 3, 2 and verse 4 to 10 says, But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ Jesus, so God can point us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us 
who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So no one of us can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. And He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the things that He planned for us long ago. Can we all just bow our heads and close our eyes tonight? I want to finish with this story. It turns out that one of history's greatest masterpieces was made from a block of marble that perfectly describes that old cliche that one man's trash is another man's treasure. There was this block of marble that created Michelangelo's David. And this block of marble had been twice discarded by other sculptors. A man named Agostino de Duccio gave up on a project using the block after which it sat untouched for 10 years. And at that point, Antonio Rossellino took, the, took a crack at the block but decided it was too much of a pain to work with. So when Michelangelo finally got his hands on it, the marble had been waiting for 40 years for someone who was up to its challenge. Michelangelo was asked about the difficulties that he must have encountered while working with this block of marble. People said to him, Michelangelo, you're amazing. You're the master craftsman. Like how did you sculpt something so beautiful, something so divine, something so perfect? out of something so ugly, something so useless, something so terrible. And Michelangelo, he looked back at these these people asking the question. He's like, it's easy. I simply took my sculpting knife and my tools and I chipped away at everything that didn't look like David until only David was left. This master sculptor chipped away at everything that didn't look like David, everything that didn't fit his image, everything that didn't fit what he was trying to create in him until only his masterpiece was left. And do you know what the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3? It says that we are God's masterpiece. You tonight are God's masterpiece. You don't need to be full of shame over the things that you have carried, over the people who have discarded you in the past, the people who may have overlooked you and said, hey, maybe there's nothing good that can come from your life. Or maybe there's no, you're never going to be able to do what you feel called to do. You don't have to worry about other people's voices. You don't have to carry the shame of that internal monologue that's in your head that tells you that you're not good enough because of whatever it is that's telling you. All you need to know tonight is that you are God's masterpiece. And when you put your life in His hands, He is faithful to make a masterpiece out of your life. You know what? You might be in this room tonight and you've never invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Saviour. You've never taken your life out of your hands and put it into the hands of God, the one who created you, the one who has a plan and a purpose for you. You never put your life into His hands. And so you've never known what it is to have your sin washed away, to have your shame dealt with, to find a love like you've never known, a peace like your friends seem to carry or the joy that Christians seem to have. You've never known what it is to have a relationship with a living God that loves you, who cares for you, who died on a cross to save you, to give you a brand new life and a brand new future. If that's you in this room tonight, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or maybe you've walked away from God. You once knew God and you walked away from Him and so tonight you'd say, I want to come back to Jesus. I want to put my life in His hands. I want to know what it is to be His masterpiece, for Him to be working on my heart and my mind and my life so that I can live in victory in every area of my life. If that's you tonight and you'd like to respond, 